Hi everyone, welcome to Commissioner Wilson's virtual office hours. Hi. Hi. Hi Commissioner. Hi. How it's are been you? a hot minute. It has been a minute or 17,000. <laughs> I don't know, my days run together, my minutes run together. I'm sorry I'm in my blankie, but it's freezing. It is here, so cold so. in here. They crank the air and it's a little rainy outside. So it's like the it, temperature just dropped. Yes. So um, my name is Lee. We got a special guest, Riley, here, Yay. who we will be introducing soon. Um, last virtual office hours, you did a tour of the Oakland uh, Town of Oakland Arts and Heritage Center. Oh my goodness. I hope if you haven't seen it, please go back and watch that it was fantastic if you haven't been out there and you live somewhere in shouting distance mm -hmm. make some time go walk on the trail finish your day by going through the arts and heritage center they have you know different exhibits that are coming there's some really cool work that they're doing in a historically um, in a, a, a cemetery that was undiscovered until recently mm -hmm. so they continue mm -hmm. to update their um, displays and all of their research so fascinating yeah, so catch that because we did a virtual tour with our homie Drew. It's Drew's birthday today. Happy birthday, Drew. We're going to be shouting Drew out We're trying to embarrass him every chance we get because he's <laughs> a really fantastic person who likes to work so hard behind the scenes. So we should celebrate his birthday really loud and as, you know, as many times as we can. We're going to yeah. call him out. <laughs> We're going to get him on the couch. You we'll wait and see. Um, so let's just jump right in because there's so much since last week that has happened. Um, we can start right off the bat with Florida Rising hosting a press conference Yeah, this here. was a big week in Orange County. And I think I, there are moments in time, you, you know this from having been here for a while, that, that like you, you think, okay, remember this, because I think this is a turning point in this county. Mm -hmm. And I think this week was one of those. We have heard from residents all across the county, even though I know this isn't exclusive to our county, who are really hurting right now because their rents have jumped. So, like in huge chunks. We're not talking about like little 5% increases. We're talking about 20, 25%, 30%, 40%, 75% increases within a matter of months. And so, you know, I think at some point, as much as we understand that there's only so much government can do because this is a market issue, mm -hmm. that we also have to do something. Mm -hmm. And so a ordinance potentially was discussed, but Florida Rising, an amazingly community organizer, um, grassroots, who really has an understanding of where we are not doing what we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean that not just with rents, but also in um, wages and in making sure that we are, because oftentimes people are like, oh, the rents are just keeping up with inflation. That only works if wages are keeping up with inflation. So um, Florida Rising did a great job organizing some of the other leaders in the area who are of similar mindset that we have to do something and work together. Mm -hmm. um, the county relies to some extent on working within parameters that the state lays out. So having state representatives here was also really important and we did. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was a, 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 a a really frustrating meeting in some ways because we didn't walk out of there with any ordinance update on the books. But what it did was it showed that our board of county commissioners is really motivated to do something. And so we called for a special session, which this will be the first one of these mm -hmm. that I've participated in as a commissioner, but I can't think of a more important issue. And, you know, we heard from other nonprofits and community organizers who are saying over and over again, we're overwhelmed with the need right now. We don't have enough money to help people. We don't have places for them to stay. Um, we don't have housing inventory for sale or for rent mm -hmm. in a certain price point. So, you know, a lot of times those things will sort of vacillate back and forth, but to not have any of that inventory and then to have people who are also paying more for gas, also paying more for everything they get in a grocery store. So, you know, it's it really tough times to call for creative measures and that's what we're trying to do. Right. And I think something that was repeated over and over about why a rent stabilization ordinance wouldn't work also was left out the fact that it's not the only thing that right. could be done. There's other things that can be done. I think a lot exactly. of the public's just looking for one step forward so that we can maybe look at the next step and the next step. So well, I think it was the easiest one to object to. OK, right. so I think that when we talked about this the first time or actually, I think when you know, some of the other commissioners talked about it even a year ago. Mm -hmm. The idea was, what can we do? It was open-ended. And we were really looking towards, you know, either the landlords out there that maybe have ideas 
um, people who worked in that realm that had, you know, either case casework or did um, rental management, you know, were their ideas that we haven't been able to employ because quite frankly, rent control is not a thing in Florida. It's actually prohibited by Florida law. So whenever, you know, we had public comment, I think people rightfully were concerned about, you know, some draconian rent control measure. Well, the Florida statutes say that if you're going to do anything that stabilizes or affects rents from being adjusted, you know, at the will of a LAM board, that it can only be in place for one year. It has to be a referendum, which means ultimately the decision would be made by you, the voter, um, and that it would have um, very specifically exemptions, including new, um, because I know one of the biggest objections we heard and continue to hear is, well, this will ruin the, the housing inventory, that no one's going to want to come and build anything here mm -hmm. if, if you have a, a rent control in place. Well, it, the new, new building, new inventory doesn't even fall into this. So new, anything that's considered luxury doesn't fall into it, which many, many, many of the apartment units in the county fall into that category. Yeah. And vacation rentals don't fall in. So really there's so many exemptions. And, and the other part is, and I, and I really understood the concern of our smaller kind of mom and pop landlords that maybe had one or two units that they, they were concerned that if they had to do maintenance or they had to do something, or their homeowner's insurance went up, right. that they had to adjust for that. They, they're exempt. So these are your, your larger commercial entities, rent um, landlords that we are talking about. And I understand that if we do move forward with putting on the ballot a rent stabilization measure, that we have to, it's only a stopgap. It allows us some time to find other ways to help people. So what we know is that there is an inventory shortage. We need more housing. We need more housing in places where it is easy for those people to get to school, to work, to wherever they need to go. So good housing near transportation corridor. Mm -hmm. um, good housing is often suggested in places like, you know, way out in the corners where it's not gonna be easy for the people who live there to, to get to where they need to go to be able to keep up the payments for that housing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, you, you can't isolate any of those things. and looking at ways to free up zoning for redevelopment and uh, infill projects and incentivizing bringing in developers that will build things at different price points instead of just luxury. Those all have to be the long-term policy goals. Right. So, you know, I don't want people to get really focused and stuck on, oh, this is rent control and this didn't work in New York and this didn't work in California. We understand all that. And honestly, I think this commission has done a really good job of not just taking in the information we got from our you know ridiculous report we got from the consultant but also having to dig it's in totally in other ways and really yeah. listening to their residents and listening to the stakeholders absolutely and just to talk about that report really quick because I'm excited to see the special session come because I think that we're going to talk about real solutions yes. I think a lot of the energy in the room was kind of sucked towards this report that yeah. was paid so by taxpayers that really omitted large data points that we all know from having our own mental health assessments, having our own uh, Children Family Services Division bring information to our offices, that there were some huge gaps in their information. Yeah. And it was very biased in even even the tone of, um, even the tone. And right. I, it, so the form, the format, and this is an example. One of the things that we're talking about that would be really a lot more um, achievable in a short term is an idea of adding a tenant's bill of rights. Right. Um, and part of that would be giving a notice to tenants. If you're, if you're getting ready to have your rent jacked up, it can't happen overnight. Right. This seems very reasonable, requiring a certain amount of notice so that people have time to make plans, figure out if they need to bring in a roommate, try to look for another place to go. And, um, that part of the report was this little blip that ended in it would not be inappropriate. And you know, I don't even like the the yeah, the verbiage. Yeah, it's yeah. very and it's kind of to slapped think, together a little. It's bit. kind of slapped together. I mean, if it had been if I'd been grading this, it would have, you know, it would have been an F because even I looked for sources. You know, there were many graphs and diagrams, but they weren't cited to anything. Right. And there was a sort of a index of citations to articles, but it didn't tell me what was being extrapolated from what. There were no footnotes. 
nothing was cited. And I, I come from a, a place where mm -hmm. if you're going to make a statement, you know, in law school, you make a statement about something, or if you're submitting something to the court, you better cite your sources. And I right. mean, every factual statement you make better show where you got it from. And the more factual statements you make, the more a report has value. The more opinion-based statements you make, the less value it has. And this one was chock full of opinion-based statements. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I hope that what we can do now is just set it aside, you know, and be like, okay, well, that was definitely a report that... Maybe get our money back? Well, you know... <laughs> or I, get more data. I will tell you, once we get past the special session, and one of the things I suggested during the meeting was that when we go to, to pay for a consultant, when we hire someone at the county, are we giving them clear direction about what we need? I would say that if we're not telling them that we require something that was uh, validated and peer reviewed and cited sources, then we're probably also needing to, to retool those parts of our own procurement, right? right? So if we are procuring a service or we have a long standing co contract, can we go back and say, look, we don't want to pay for that unless it contains a certain level of data. We don't, we don't need an opinion piece. We get lots of those every day on the phone, right? in the hallway, in the right. And there were just some things that are just inaccurate. Yep. You know, we had our amazing nonprofit partner, Matthews Hope, come out and speak to some of the things that he's seeing on the front lines of yes. the homelessness crisis here. And the data just really didn't truly represent our homeless student population currently, our, our um, you know, individuals that are residents that are living in their cars, in hotels right. that aren't being uh, necessarily tracked through the same data points that we currently have in the system, the HMIS system. So there was just a lot of holes There's in the a lot information. Of holes and the conclusion was that that the media has essentially given this more attention than what was actually warranted. Once again, unbelievable to come up with a conclusory statement without actually having talked to people who serve those people. So um, the reality of it is they used one set data set for what they felt like was, you know, the, their sort of snapshot of homelessness. We, because we started working on this the day we walked in here and trying to figure out how to help people, what we found out about the data set they use is that it does, it, it chronically undercounts. And even the people who do the counting for that data set will tell you, right. we know we're missing people. We can't get to the people who are oftentimes sleeping 17 in a room. We cannot get to the people, they don't count for this. Mm -hmm. And so to have a supposed expert tell us that um, that homelessness is a social and complex problem that isn't always related to finances was an like honestly like steam coming out of my ears that it was so tone deaf to the woman that stood in front of us an hour before that and said I'm living in my car because right. I can't pay my rent anymore. Right. So yeah. Anyway, it's emotional, right? Because you, you like how does how did how did he sit and listen to that mm -hmm. and then come to the to the podium and contradict it by saying, but we have data that contradicts that. And then not really even giving us the data that contradicts that. Right. Um, so maybe you can explain why a special session so soon and what's going to be the next step at the next Board of County Commission meeting. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, it's very, to me, um, optimistic that we're doing a special session because it means we don't have to wait for the next Board of County Commission meeting in order to, to go back to this issue. We know it's pressing. And if we are looking at that rent stabilization that we're going to be, you know, potentially putting on a ballot, we have to finish that and get it wrapped up and sent over. Language, language has to be um, legally completely correct and ready to go and sent over to the supervisor of elections in order for you to be able to see it on your November ballot, which is what's required by state law. So we're on a time crunch for that. But ultimately, the other part of it was we all, and I mean the entire board, when you see a whole board caring enough to continue a conversation past what was an extended period of discussion, then we needed to do that. And every, every single commissioner, I believe, maybe one wasn't, but the rest of them really felt strongly that we needed to spend more time talking about solutions and less time focusing on you know, our complaints about the information we were given, right? So we know we have limited time. We know that our report maybe was sub substandard. But what we have to do now is take what we do have, which is a wealth of census data. Um, we have great community partners and nonprofit partners with their own data. We have amazing stakeholders from industry, from our 
you know, out in our nonprofit world and other jurisdictions that we can draw on. Mm -hmm. And so to having all of that coming in, sitting down and just having only one topic to talk about, and that is what we're gonna do in order to try to bring relief to people who are being priced out of their rentals because the rental skyrock skyrocketing rental costs. Right. Awesome. Well, stay tuned and please check our um, social media as well as sign up for the newsletter that Hannah will definitely make sure all this information is in at www.nicolewilson.org. Yeah. And if you have any questions about it, because it is, I mean, it is complex. And I, I, you know, I'm not saying that in the way that I think I can break it down for you any, you know, to make it simple because it's not going to be. But, but if you have a question, please reach out. Because I, I do think that sometimes unless, until I hear, or unless I hear from people, there are things that aren't brought to my attention. And we've had some of the most important things that we've worked on in this office brought to us because somebody heard us talking or saw something that we wrote mm -hmm. and reached out. So please right. don't ever hesitate to do that. Right. And I, I think just for me, you know, the biggest hole that I didn't really feel was the justification of the increases at that percentage over the course of just a short period of time, right? Like. Like it sounded like an average annual lease increase was between like six to like 15%, no, maybe not like not even like, like that. Well, in the report, what was like 15% is like, okay, but it's like 25 to 40% oh. right now. And yeah. I didn't hear any landlord say, well, my this, 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 and this went up by this percent. I didn't hear those numbers to justify why we're okay with seeing such dramatic increases outside of, well, it's market rate. Well, it could also be price gouging. Well, like, yeah, and I was gonna say the report specifically said that they didn't address profiteering as a condition. Well, then that was one more data set we didn't get, mm -hmm. right? That was one more piece of information that we didn't get. And I think to your point, we do understand inflation's happening right now. So if you are a landlord who has to reinvest in something, that it may be costing you more, that's understandable. But that should be somewhere in the same line that we're seeing inflation, right? Right. Over the last twenty years, those increases, like the largest jump, something you know was something like four or five percent. Mm -hmm. I think six percent was the highest over twenty or twenty-five years. Last year, it was twenty-five percent. Just last year, right? So what? And, and I mean, this was probably an underreporting, right? That's right. all we could get our hands on. So what that tells you is that is dramatic and it's unexpected because the inflation we're seeing has been happening. You know, we've seen this incremental inflation. We haven't seen it at 25% overnight. Right. And so, you know, what's a missing piece here? And that's really what we needed to get at. Right. So stay tuned for that. Um, also, there was a lot of public engagement on the Discovery Church yes. um, public hearing. Yes, yeah, so this um, was relating to actually our Lake Avalon Rural Settlement in District 1. Lake Avalon Rural Settlement people, if you're here, thank you so much for being so plugged in, so engaged. I can't tell you how grateful I am for the work that you put in doing really what I think should have fallen on us as a, as a, your government, protecting your, your property. Because um, the Rural Settlement Guidelines, the Rural Settlement is set aside for people who um, have very specifically, you know, either grazing lands or sometimes it's a, a, a small orchard, but it's one house per 10 acres. I think there's some areas that it's one house per five acres. Um, and there are specific guidelines for not being able to build intense or dense structures there. And there was an application for um, a, a church, it was Discovery Church, really kind, generous people. And I think they have a lovely mission. I hope that they are able to see past sort of, I think, what was a, a, a fairly heated debate about the use, land use there. Um, and I hope they understand that for at least I, I, what I believe is a very welcoming and kind community, that they were really just concerned about the size. Mm -hmm. um, it was 44,000 square feet and um, held like something, 750 um, seats, large stage set type, um, really looked like an event hall. And they were very concerned about the what that would bring as far as traffic and um, and what the effects would be of their overall environment. And I think to understand their position, you have to understand that when I came into office, one of the first things I found out was that they were trying to keep development from the Lake County side 
from encroaching into their backyards and very intense density development mm -hmm. on the Lake County mm -hmm. side where they don't really have an elected official because they're Orange County residents. Um, we have since then, of course, been able to connect with our Lake County representative on that side and forge a good relationship, understanding that some of those approvals, just like how I inherited some lousy approvals, um, have already been given. But what can we do now to try to give them some buffer and protect their rural way of life? People, I think, sort of see the rural community as being, I don't know, something of the past that we just need to get rid of or give up. But what you don't understand is that if you go to your farmer's market, a lot of times when you're getting something that was raised locally, your local honey, your, you know, your, your eggs, that that may have come from right there. And the best way for us to be able to feed ourselves um, without having to worry about supply ch chain issues, without having to worry about some big international inflation issue, is to really preserve those smaller independent agricultural businesses um, the way, the best way for us to preserve our own environment is to make sure that we have open space right. and that we can recharge water that falls in rain and we haven't paved over everything. And, and that's why we've set aside areas to be specifically preserved in that way. And so the rural settlement folks are, they're been on the defensive for a long time. And I just want, you know, if, if you're tuning in or if you are a member of Discovery Church, I love everything I learned about this church, everyone I met from this church, and I really believe in the mission and the work that, that this church does. But I think in order to best serve the people in the community where the church builds itself, mm -hmm. they need to have a community that needs them and wants them. Mm -hmm. And what this community is saying is, we just need the pasture land. Mm -hmm. We need the farmland. And so my hope is that we hear soon about them finding some great location. Um, you know, ideally, how neat would it be if they were they found a cool infill project, right? They need 40, 44,000 square feet. That's like a uh, Walmart neighborhood center. I know there's several big box stores right on 50 in West Orlando, West Orange mm, County, right. that could really use an infill project. You know, so right. I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful that they'll be able to find that and that that they can serve the community the way they want to and the way I know that they will when they find that at home. Yeah. And, you know, I, I really want to talk about that point that you made about our rural communities and how they need to be preserved. From the constituent services that I've heard, they're really under attack. Like, they get calls from developers trying to poach their properties. All the time. Very, very, like, I heard one lady say she gets, like, 17 calls a day from developers asking her crazy amounts of money which is, you know, one tactic, but ultimately they want to keep their lifestyle, that rural way that probably came from their grandparents and their grandparents and their grandparents that before that. Um, it's a lifestyle that we're not really finding incentives to keep in place. Like I don't really see programs to help farmers keep their farms. No, I just see this like the, status quo small. of like, oh, it's just growth. This is just the way yeah. that the, the county's growing. And it's like, what are we doing to preserve those farmers that want to keep their lifestyle? Because otherwise, if they're getting annexed all around them and hyperdensity all around them, their horses are going to get scared and not have the same behavior. Yep. All the wildlife in the area, all the, the biodiverse insects that they need in order to grow crops are going to decline. I mean, yep. we are costing them mm -hmm. their economic like livelihood. Exactly. And I think the part that's really hard to... Um hard to sort of explain about why they are getting pressured the way they are and, and even why probably this application came forward um, is that it's less expensive to buy mm -hmm. a, a larger parcel there right. because of their zoning. Mm -hmm. So we zoned them rural agricultural because that's what they are mm -hmm. and the requirement in our code, our comprehensive plan says one dwelling unit per 10 acres and any commercial uses need to be related to agriculture. And because of that use, that designated use, if someone goes to sell their land, the, the price point, the appraised value and price point is lower, which then makes it very attractive for somebody who wants to use it for something else. Right. So it's almost like this, um, it, it's like a cycle where we're, you, know, you, you try to zone them away to protect them from that type of intensity and density. Mm -hmm. And because of that zoning, they, the, the price points are so attractive 
to the developers who want that intensity and density. Right. And you know, I don't I don't know what the answer is other than you know we have protections in our comprehensive plan and we just need to be able to um, uphold what's already written. And and you know in this particular case on Tuesday the the um, the church had to go through a special exception because the zoning was not for this type of use, this intensity of use. So the special exception had a number of things that had to be satisfied in order for an approval. And essentially they couldn't satisfy those. And one of them was that it wouldn't be a negative intrusion into the community. Mm -hmm. And when you have standing room only meetings for months, the first time we went out there months ago, standing room only saying, please, please don't build this this big here. Please don't bring this many cars in here. Please don't do this. You know, if you want to get smaller and fit, we, we would love that, but not this size, not this big. That that is an a, yeah. an intrusion that they are, you know, it, by definition in our comprehensive plan that they are unable to then satisfy to get the special exception. Right, and they didn't compromise. I mean, at the meeting they said, no, this is the smallest we're going to go. Yeah, I think they dropped like another a couple thousand square feet, but it wasn't it not even close. The next, so there are you know two other churches that were brought up during the hearing. In the rural settlement, they both are 16,000 square feet or around there between 15 and 16,000 square feet. So you're talking about less than half the size. And um, and when I think, you know, when I was saying, I think if you could match those, that the that the community, you know, would be able to say that that's something that fits. There's, you know, if you're really there to serve that community, that if you're building, a, you know, a place that seats literally twice the population of the community, it's hard to say that you're actually there to serve that community. And I think um, to hear that they weren't willing to drop it, even not even in the ballpark of close right. to what the other churches are was, it was, you know, I think it was, it was just where they were willing to land and they were going to take the chances on getting to a vote. And that's literally what their representative said was, I think we're willing to go to a vote now because I, I you know, there was some opportunity to go to a continuance and to see if they could come down and, and they wanted to go to a vote. And, and it just, you know, the, the county commission heard and read the exceptions and, and upheld the denial. All righty. There you have it, folks. Um, well, you know what? I just have to say that thank you for understanding the value of that rural lifestyle. You know, I just don't know if that's something that's going to last forever. And I think that, you know, I, I'm scared for when you're no longer in office, like what's going to happen out there. So, well, we all have to, I think, try to do what we can to explain to everybody we can. And I, my hope is that even some of the people I got to meet that were church members and, and parishioners and elders there, that maybe it'll take a, you know, a moment of reflection to see what it was about the community that, that did not make this work. And maybe they'll start seeing the value that they had to understand that there's, we need areas for water recharge. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? Well, it means clean water for your children and grandchildren, you know, right. and, and it means fresh fruit on your table and all of those things. So I, I'm hopeful because if I wasn't hopeful, I wouldn't be able to come back every day. <laughs> right. Um, okay. Well, let's chat a little bit about your Metro Plan Orlando um, meeting. Okay. So Metro Plan Orlando, of course, is the um, it's the transportation planning agency in this area that, that is, it's multi-jurisdictional. There are commissioners from multiple counties, cities, uh, the mayor of Orlando, uh, mayor of Orange County mm -hmm. sit on it. And then we additionally have um, representation from the state and sometimes federal government. And so we were, um, I am actually an alternate. I'm still waiting for my seat on Metro Plan. I've asked okay. and asked and asked. I know. Always ride, made, never ride. But I, I am fortunate that because every other commissioner has a seat, that as an alternate, I seem to be needed a lot. And, um, and I always really appreciate being there because the discussions are um, important and I think relevant to so many things that are happening that we talk about in District 1 and that are happening in Orange County and are specifically sometimes really affecting Orange County residents. And this right. was one of those meetings. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you had brought up is, is that, you know, you worked a lot with, um, you know, obviously environmental pollution because you're an environmental lawyer. And one of the big things is um, air quality improvements and requirements from the state and from the federal government. Yeah. What did they talk about when it came to that? Yeah, this was really an interest. It was interesting for me to be there on a day that they were talking about our um, really requirements in order to to satisfy um, 
what's been established in the Clean Air Act. And the Clean Air Act, of course, was something that was put in place after um, after industrialization. There was just an unbelievable amount of air pollution, and this was before we even really understood a lot about ozone or carbon and what it was doing to our, our planet. This was just about people literally waking up and not being able to breathe. And um, if you ever have a chance to look up the, you know, the history of the Clean Air Act, very tragic case in a uh, little town near, um, I think it was a copper mine, a smelt, mm -hmm. where there was some, uh, a weather condition that took the pollution, the air pollution that had been coming out of this particular um, operation for a long time, and it sort of sunk it in on this town. And it essentially was a catastrophe, and it killed part of a town. And after this happened, they realized that there needed to be some regulations, and the government had a role uh, to make sure that if there was some kind of an operation in the area that was putting something in the air, um, the air doesn't know that it's left the vicinity of a factory. The air just moves and can you know, move around and kill people in the area. So part of the Clean Air Act is monitoring air quality and there's a set parameter for areas across the country it's not the same because air is very different when you're down at sea level as opposed to being in the mountains it's different you know up in the north down in tropical areas so it's different in different places but essentially these parameters tell us when if we are getting to a certain number that we may be risking some health mm -hmm. now Obviously, because science, thank goodness, continues to evolve and people do more research and we understand more and more about the impacts of different pollutants on the body, um, those standards have gotten stricter over the years. Mm -hmm. And something that people know for a fact now that they may not have known some years ago um, is about the health impacts of ozone. And that there is very specifically a, a, some bio... Um, processes that create ozone and we sort of know what they are we know what causes them and we understand now that once it gets to a certain level we are doing damage to our residents we are doing damage sometimes and we're being um, not compliant with the clean air act and the federal government does monitor this so we have orange county um, our environmental protection division has monitoring and they report to the state the state in the in the county send their information to our our EPA, our federal EPA, and it's all tracked. And one of the things that we learned um, at MetroPlan was that there has been an ongoing eye on these ozone levels and the clean air monitoring in Orange County because it appears as though the new standards that were set in 2015, that we're, we may be ticking closer to being out of attainment. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that, you know, if we pass that parameter, the federal government says you, you're in the danger zone and you're probably hurting your residents. I think if you talk to people in specific areas in Orange County, they would tell you that they've already suffered. Right. That they, we, we can pretty much hone in on areas where there are higher incidences of asthma and, and cardiovascular and cardiopulmonary disease. And you don't have to look far to see what the potential environmental hazard is near them. Right. Sometimes it's just a crisscross of highways. Sometimes it's that they took out a forest and they have a crisscross of highways. You know, I'm saying that if we if Save we do those trees, things, people. if we do those things, <laughs> we shouldn't be shocked mm. to see these hot spots of higher rates of mm -hmm. asthma and and um, other pulmonary disease. So, long story short, at MetroPlan this week, because I was just lucky enough to be there on that day, they went over the attainment and the data and the research on um, basically where we are and what's causing us to get getting closer to being in violation. Mm -hmm. The reason why I kind of want to bring it up here and tell you all, other than that it's really important because it's your health and your welfare and your well-being, is that there are things you can do. So when they break it out and they look at all the things that sort of contribute we know that tailpipe, driving a car, mm -hmm. driving a gas, you know, gas car, is one of the issues. It's one of many issues. It's a high one, right? Tailpipe is probably the highest nationally. One of the things that blew my mind when we looked locally is what idling is doing. Mm -hmm. Now, what is idling? It's when you get to your kid's school early and you put it in park, but you leave the car on and you read a book. Mm -hmm. It is 
really, really harmful. Right. And look, I get it. There are times you got to rush off to a doctor's appointment. You got to get somewhere, soccer practice, dance practice. Just turn the car off. Right. Well, other windows. You can still read the book. You can still hang out. Maybe walk in, see if they need a volunteer. I always found that, you know, that those schools typically need help. They need a lot of help. Even if it's just, you know, putting library books back on the library or picking up, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, kids' lunch trays. So I get it. You want to be there. You want to be close to your kids at their school and you want to maybe scoot out of there as soon as there's dismissal. But idling in the car is, is really showing to be a, a problem. And the other interesting report that we got on the same day in Metro Plan was across the state right now, there's a problem. You know, obviously people are ordering a lot more of their goods in. And so we get a lot of deliveries. There's a lot of deliveries coming in. A lot of those come in trucks. We don't have as many freight trains as we used to. Uh, we haven't quite gotten to the drone thing yet. So right now we're in that middle ground where we have a lot of trucks on the road. And truck drivers need a place, trucks need a place to pull over and sleep for the night. It's not safe if they can't sleep. They need to be able to have a safe place to park it and get their good night's rest, right? We're all safer for that. And there's just not enough places for that. So Department of Transportation at the same meeting brought up the need for finding places for overnight parking for trucks. Well, what we found out is there is another metric in the ozone, the air quality, um, called hoteling. And I, I you know, raised my hand and I said, doctor, because we had a really cool professor there t teaching us about this, um, these metrics. And I said, what is hoteling? And he said, oh, that's idling overnight. So essentially, what that then turned into was, if we are looking for locations, if the state of Florida and Metroplan and local governments are looking for places for overnight parking for trucks, can we find a place for them to be able to hook into electric so they can turn off the gas? Because really what they're doing is they're running little generators out there, right? You're out there, you're doing your rig, and you need your air conditioning. You, you know, you, you need to be able to, I don't know, use your, your phone so you've got it plugged in so your, car, so your truck's running. That idling is really harmful. And so it was really an interesting timing to hear this need for overnight parking at the same time as really learning about what idling is doing to our air quality. Um, there's going to be meetings coming up. The Department of Transportation is hosting a meeting here in Orange County. We will get information out to you about that, um, about potential locations for overnight parking for, for these trucks. I am you know, somebody who really believes in trying to find other ways for us to get around besides using our gas guzzling vehicles. But I'm here to tell you that right now, I'm very grateful for our truckers. They are bringing us our medicine. They are bringing us our, you know, our food. Our, they're bringing us lots of things that if we didn't have them until we can get that, you know, actual freight trains back running or figure out other ways to get supplies to people, that's all we've got. Mm -hmm. And so having knowing that how do we keep them safe how do we keep the rest of the cars on the road safe make sure these people are well rested and how do we make sure that we're not depleting our you know our our own health and well-being by adding more uh, the car fumes out there right more gas fumes so that's sort of the takeaway from metro plan it was a little heavy right but it was important very stuff interesting yeah very very interesting so without any further ado i would like to introduce riley Riley. Hi. I met her on Instagram. I'm, I'm doing good. Um, so we did not make a formal announcement on this yet, and Hannah wants to jump in. So Hannah, come sit on the couch. She just Hannah. Okay. <laughs> Drew, you come too. Come on, Drew. Come on. Let's, Drew. Go. Let's, go. let's do a whole team. Let's go. Let's, go. let's come on. Team D1. What? Oh, team D1. Right here. You don't have to have the mic. Drew, please. please. Yes. We, everybody please. Just wants to see those beautiful pearly whites. <laughs> Come on, Drew. Um, okay, so he's camera wait. shy, oh, even though he deals come with a camera come here, come, come with like here. literally his whole career. Come here, because this is the team. This yeah, is the team. this is the team. Yeah. This is a dream team. This is the team. People are like, how are you everywhere? And we're here, here, right there. Oh my God! Thank you. Everybody just turn, turn do. I off. have the coolest team or what? This is the best. Look at this. Um, so I have a sad but happy but sad announcement. So I am actually going to be transitioning from the senior aide position into an on-call position. 
Um, because uh, <laughs> Representative Carlos Guillermo Smith has asked me to be his campaign manager, you, so this Carlos. is my official. <laughs> um, this is my official announcement, and in this time. I have been slowly transitioning um, Riley here to become <laughs> So awesome. We're very I'm excited. excited. Um, I'm so, so happy that she's coming. Okay. First and foremost, I am not just leaving. Okay, I am going to be on call. I'm going to be answering texts. I'm going to be answering her. emails. And I'm she didn't be... just say that because I had a panic attack <laughs> and she first started talking. To I am me. not <laughs> leaving at all i am still going to be like on the payroll mm -hmm. but only hourly based on when i'm needed so i'm not just jumping ship um and you know i just want to say that i've had an absolute honor serving commissioner wilson um <sighs> serving the people, people of district one getting to learn and meet everything that there is to know about the county and all of the incredible staff that we have who work hard every single day that deserve so much hugs the happy cards and money. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, and also being able to really develop a team yeah. to, to help carry out what Commissioner Wilson has been at the forefront of championing in her incredible transition and to becoming a commissioner. I get to see her kind of learn and flourish in this role and then bring on dedicated people who are just going to support the things that she really wants to see done in this community. And it's, it is sad because I really love this job. Me personally, I bring it up every virtual office hour. This is an election year. It is the most important election year of our lives. I'm 32 years old. I just bought a house here. I don't know if I'm going to have a happy retirement future here because I'm so scared of some of the decisions that are being made at the state level. And so I started to panic a little bit when I saw a lot of these headline politics happening this year so close to an election year and seeing that carlos guillermo smith who i love and want to say hello to he's just been such an awesome champion for pretty much everything that aligns with me morally and to see that he was redistricted into a pretty contentious new race where now there's two republican candidates that are going to be gunning for the same seat i i want to get in the fight i'm eager I'm, I'm, you know, and Commissioner Wilson's good. She's got a great team. Listen, she's doing a great you know, job. She doesn't necessarily need me, but yeah, I, you know, I'm still around. I said to her, "Oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know. This is like I haven't done this without you because we mm -hmm. started. We walked in here. It was a blank slate, mm -hmm. and you know what a mark, what a mark you've made. You touched so many lives." And I mean, there are people out in my community who stop me and say, oh, that Lee, you know, she is the best. And I'm like, I know, I know she is. I know she is. And to have, I think, that tie always to people and have that gift that you've given them of your time and your energy and your passion, I'm so grateful for it. And I think, you know, my anxiety about you going is absolutely balanced by the fact that I believe that wherever you go, you are going to have that same impact and make such a difference. And right now you're right. There is so much to get done. And I think I couldn't be any more blessed to have Riley right here coming in and getting the chance to learn from you. I mean, you know, we literally got here and we're like the drawers are empty and yeah. um, the computer's empty there was no and training uh, so we, situation for me so, yeah, so i had to ask a lot of questions yeah and so the momentum is there and we will keep that up and i will say hannah has you know been this perfect puzzle piece with the knowledge and policy and so i really believe that even having to having to share <laughs> that there's enough for me to go around there is a, and the impacts will continue on and that's the important part because i think knowing what you believe in and what you're passionate about continues to be what we work on and so that will continue on and i so fundamentally believe in the work that carlos gamer smith does for the people of florida and has like a a true heart for his community and so understanding that role of that the state and how important all that is to local government i'm glad we'll have we'll have you in that position 
I'm super excited. I just say that, you know, it is, it is so hard right now because I have imposter syndrome. Like I've, I had when you first asked me to come on, I was like, no, why, why would you ask me? Don't, aren't there more people who have way more experience? Like I just came from the little nonprofit world. I'm, I'm not in politics. I don't know. And you gave me a chance to help me understand that this was my area. This was my, so good. my skill sets as a person fit really well in this space. I feel that same amount of imposter syndrome moving into a campaign manager role because campaigns are very challenging, very fast paced. You have to juggle a lot of different things, but campaigns are more successful when you lead with a full heart. Yeah. Mm. And I think this office, yes. and, and one of the things I'm the most proud of is that I've really tried to deal with every scenario with a full heart. And that's why I feel like these, next this transition is going to be you know it's going to be great riley's going to learn how to take care of people with that full heart mentality too and district one is going to just continue to get full service yeah i was going to say whole heart yeah. full yes. heart whole heart like you know and i and i think that is i think that leading with kindness and love mm -hmm. is it's contagious mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the same way that people think about things that are destructive Mm. But we just have to highlight it and we have to keep spreading it. And so, you know, if I think of it that way, it's not really a goodbye. Mm -hmm. It's just a Well, I mean, you, I, I still need you and Hannah specifically so much because you guys teach me so much. Like your legal brain, your policy brain. <laughs> I just like, I don't know what I'm going to do without having it like at my fingertips every single second. But obviously it I'm is still going to be around <laughs> it is <laughs> still um i'm still going to be around and i'd love to learn more about Riley. Yes, introduce yes. yourself to the people and your personal why of your interest with working with commissioner yes hi everyone my name is riley k hodges i am a recent graduate from the university of central florida good night hey. and i tried on um i was an environmental studies major with a political science minor so a lot of yeah, I know, geez, it's like the perfect world. I know, I yes. you. So I'm really passionate about, you know, the environment. And I met Commissioner Wilson through an environmental talk show that I have. She was so amazing to have on. We talked about clean water. So that's how I met her. But you know, I mean, the fact that we, the, the, the talk show ended and I think I might have kept on talking because it's so exciting yeah. to talk to somebody else who was so excited about the topic and there was an instant connection. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. then I reached out to Lee and I said, hey, are there any opportunities? And they were like, yeah. And it just, it got better and better. So yeah. I'm really excited to be here and to serve the people of District 1. What are some of you your future through. aspirations? What is, what are some of the things you're working on no personally pressure. that you want to kind of evolve into? We won't hold her to anything. You're going to run for president, right? <laughs> I hope so. No, no. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. But um, I plan to she go to... say no. <laughs> I plan to go to law school to become an environmental attorney, so... That's the, I know, that's the. You got law school here every single day. Ultimate goal. Yeah, seriously. We got the Florida constitutional law book in the office. <laughs> she's always putting some, She she's definitely influencing Hannah, I think, to go to law school. She's, always she's been trying to convince me for uh, a year now. So. <laughs> Right. You got you to do it. You gotta well, do it. So. I always am so insulted with people like, we have enough lawyers. I'm like, we don't have enough good lawyers. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough lawyers that care about things that matter. And I, and I don't mean that in a way that I think we need lawyers of, that will represent our Constitution. And that's mm -hmm. important. I think there are things that have been overlooked by the law. And so to me, environmental law is so exciting because there's room for creativity. Mm -hmm. There's room for like problem solving in a completely different way and there's such a need there's such a need and especially public interest environmental law so i get very excited about the idea of having you know somebody who's curious about it and that i can see sort of a trajectory from here um in you know it's just an honor to have you here and Thank to you. yes i love i i'm, I'm just mm -hmm. very very nature, grateful nature is the best client that's right. It, it, you have the most no innocent wrong. clients. It pays, yeah. you, it pays you with its beauty and glory, right. not necessarily And money. that's it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you know. And your clean water and clean right, air. Right. With the invaluable everything. things. Yeah. 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 So, so exactly. I'm super excited. As you know, please continue to email district1 at ocfl.net. Sign up for the incredible newsletters that got like a 45% open rate last week. Awesome. Just going to shout out Hannah again. You know, Riley is lucky because the people of District 1 They're so are the best group they are in so, Orange County. It's true. Absolutely. They are so involved. We don't do anything out there that it's not standing room only. Everybody is... The communication, they want to know what's going on. They are they are really plugged in. Mm -hmm. And to me, my worst nightmare was to show up at the stop on day one and nobody would care. And like apathy would just be everywhere. It is the exact opposite. And I, it just makes me really grateful for you all. I'm so excited for you to get to meet some of our wonderful residents as time goes on. And, mm -hmm. and we can, you know, go do some field trips out yeah. and do one because it is really the most beautiful place too. We have some of what I feel like are some of these, you know, hidden treasures in Orange County. Yeah. Awesome. You know, it's true. Lee, Lee provides unparalleled uh, constituent services. That's for sure. And so, I think really just people just want know. to be heard. You know, if you just take the time to listen yeah. and you really try to problem solve and actually try to fix certain issues. I know government's slow, but I think just people want to hear that someone's paying attention and that they equally are as passionate about the subject matter and, that's all. That's all. That's your. That's your training. That's it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, having <laughs> local government to me seems like it should be the most accessible. Mm -hmm. It should be the most friendly. Mm -hmm. It should be the place where someone does try to help you. Even you know, I mean, there are so many things that come in our door that don't necessarily fall under the purview of Orange County's services or, or even you know, within our our. our ability but we really try and we try to make sure that we're doing our best every day and i i think that you know as long as you stay in touch with us we're going to keep on getting that information out and we will um make sure that lee checks in periodically also on the Surprise couch, couch Surprise. Visit. on Surprise. the couch, yeah. couch visit. i probably will um but you know what drew will teach you everything you need to know he actually knows this entire <laughs> county like the back of his hand yeah drew is the pro <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes. So thank you all so much, and thank you, Commissioner. You want to I had yes, yes, really quickly. I kind of wanted to touch base on mm -hmm. if somebody is tuned in, and um, I know there's been a lot of activity online and in questions about um, the Dr. Phillips Marketplace. We still don't have an application on file, so yes. I don't want you to think I'm ignoring you. And there's stuff going on behind the scenes. And nobody has reached out to me. Mm -hmm. We have no application. I, I've had no developer call me about a pre-app meeting. We've had nothing except for um, the residents, and I appreciate that. So, if you get something, if you hear from somebody, let me know. We will continue to hopefully be able to navigate whatever does come in if it does come in. Right. And a reminder: we talked about this at the June first community meeting. If you want to get on. The email list. We will be yeah. do we do emails by like geographic area in District One as well. So you'll be added to the general newsletter. But if you want to email us at District One at OCFL, or if you're an HOA yes. president or member or anything, send us that contact info. We will add you to the list and make sure you have all the information we have. Which, like Commissioner said, at this point is pretty much zip. Yeah, we haven't gotten anything, but we do, you know, make sure that you know, we send out everything we have, all of yes. our information. I know sometimes it's probably pretty dry to see every development plan or every application, right. but I think that having it out there if people are curious is more important than, than anything. So you can zoom by the things that don't, you know, really matter, but if you have any extra questions about stuff, just let us know. We love you. We love you, District 1. You're the best. District 1. District 1. <laughs> Have a happy Friday. See you later. Bye. Friday's tomorrow. <laughs>